Good morning. Special greetings to our chapel service and um, hope that you have a blessed Sunday with us. I know you're expecting to have a great Sunday anyhow, right? It's Super Bowl Sunday, so we're excited about that. The Eagles are playing, that other team, and, uh, and so we're, we're excited about that. And I bet most of you have got plans tonight. You're going to go to a Super Bowl party, and Super Bowl parties are important, right? They, they represent a change in seasons because that's the official end of your New Year's resolutions. <laughs> Is because now there's chips and dip and wings, and so we, we just eventually put the illusion aside. And everybody loves them. Super Bowl parties are awesome. Uh, there's only one group of people who don't like them, and those are the people who want to watch the game. Right? Everybody else enjoys them, but those who are watching it just get really frustrated, and like, you know, I just love some peace and quiet so I can hear myself screaming at the TV. That's all I want at this moment. Uh, my name's Eugene. I'm the directional pastor here. For those of you who don't know me, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, I, my sermon today is titled Some Peace and Quiet. And as an introvert, I love some peace and quiet. But today, the scripture that we're going to consider sets them apart from one another. And peace and quiet are not quite the same thing. And, uh, and one is vastly superior to the other. So if you'd open your Bibles to Zechariah, if you want to find your way there, you can find Matthew in the New Testament, dial back a few pages. Zechariah is a contemporary of Haggai. We've been looking at Haggai the last couple of weeks. He's a prophet. The season he's in is a time of reconcil- re- restoring Jerusalem. It's the best way to put it. The people have come back from exile. They were in Babylon, and then things changed, and policies changed, and the people were allowed to return to the city of God, they did so in droves, and there they start building the temple. Things get delayed. Uh, there are local strong men that impede process. People become discouraged. And Haggai speaks to them in that point. He says, guys, you came here to reconsecrate the city. You need to complete the work. You need to start building. And they do. Zechariah is a contemporary. He's at the same point. And he's having the same conversation, right? He's saying to them, it's time to build. So you've got two prophets simultaneously telling the same message. There is a single difference, though. That is, while Haggai is speaking on a very um, earthly plane, Zechariah sees things from a heavenly perspective. Haggai is saying, guys, this is what I see. I see rubble and it ought not to be. And yet, this is the house of God Zechariah looks at me and says, I want you to see the heavens and what's happening on the spiritual realm. And that's what we have in chapter 1. And I want us to look at verse 7. Here he has a vision, and that vision is very, very telling. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Idu, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man was riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, and behind him were red sorrel and white horses. Then I said, What are these, my Lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing amongst the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing amongst the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth and behold, all the earth remains at rest or at peace. That's the first indication. It is a vision, a prophetic vision, Zechariah receives in it. They're angels four of them with four horses, and they have patrolled the earth. Four horses, four corners of the earth. They have patrolled the inhabited world. And they come back with the report, and the report is this. The world is at peace. The world is at rest. And that sounds good, right? I mean, if you go to a beauty pageant, that's the desire, world peace. You go to the UN, what's the desire? World peace. We have finally in Scripture a moment this divine moment where it seems like we have world peace. This would be something that should then be followed with applause and celebration, and yet it isn't. The resulting words are words of despair. 
The world is at rest. Verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord said, O Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you've been angry these 70 years? Uh How interesting is that? We've just been told the world is at peace and yet it's a matter of despair because God's anger is somehow attached to this peace. Well, let me give you the historical background. You can understand why there is despair. In the geopolitical realm of that time, the people of God, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar. He was a Babylonian. That's today Iraq. The people were taken to captivity, to Babylon. That's where they dwelled. And they did that for 70 years. But things kept moving in that area because even further east, the Persians grew up, and there was an incredible leader by the name of Cyrus, and he conquered the Babylonians. And so now the Persians, Iran, right, conquers everything that the Babylonians had. It becomes a massive empire. Everything from Western Asia all the way to Egypt is now this one consolidated empire, and Cyrus rules it all. And he does until his death. And his son takes over and succeeds him. And he decides to expand the borders even more. And so he leads an army to the Egyptians and goes and does battle with Egypt and conquers them. Now, the Persian Empire includes the whole known world, just about. Egypt all the way to Western Asia is one empire. Cyrus' son comes home. You would imagine a ticker tape parade. But when he gets back, he finds out, no, someone has stolen his throne. A usurper has claimed the throne for himself. And in mysterious circumstances, Cyrus' son commits suicide. Well, Darius, who is an official in the Persian army, he's a royal, and he's also a military officer, he does what military officers do in those circumstances. He leads a coup d'etat. And he has a military takeover. And he conquers the throne from this usurper and makes the empire his. Darius is now the emperor of the world. Sounds good. Well, there are all sorts of strong men and kingpins around that empire. And they see disruption as opportunity. And so they start raising their heads in that given moment thinking, now's the time of our independence. And Darius, being a military man, resolves to restore his empire with the blade, and he does, and a bloody episode follows. And at the time you hear of this prophecy, Darius has restored order, and he has done it through the blood of his opponents. Everybody's in line. Everybody's agreeable. There is peace. Peace. It's the kind of peace that comes through oppression, where you fall in line or else. It's the kind of peace that says, you will sing the chorus. You will signify the virtue. You will endorse the leadership. You will be enthusiastic. And that's the nature of the world. Jerusalem is in a world of peace, but it's a peace that's brought about by oppression. There isn't any genuine peace to it, and there is despair in it. And when I read this, I can't help but think of our current circumstances in our culture. We live in a world where things have changed so drastically and there is a very militant secularism that is dominant and ascending in our culture and and it creates great alarm, particularly for those who are a little older. And I've spoken to some of the uh, younger evangelicals this past week and their thoughts about the culture wars. And they're not nearly as alarmed as I am or my contemporaries are. And I remember when I was young and I heard older people alarmed about the way of the world and I'd think it's really not that bad. But I lacked something. In my youth, I lacked a point of reference. And that's what I have as I've grown older is a point of reference. I actually remember the way things were and I see the things that have changed. And all the changes are not necessarily for the good and it creates a sense of alarm. Particularly as it comes to religious freedoms. Never in my youth did I ever think religious freedoms would ever be threatened in the West, and yet increasingly they are. And as the culture becomes more hostile to the things of faith, there is a conformity that is enforced, 
And Christians are having to figure out how do we conduct ourselves in a world that demands conformity. So there are a couple of options available, it would seem. The first one is just to give up. Many Christians have chosen that. Okay, Sarah, Sarah, we'll just make do and get along. We'll keep our peace, you keep your peace, we'll cohabit. That was the deal, right? You endorse your views, I'll endorse my views, and we'll just keep them private and tidy. Others have decided they're going to shore up. What we will do is uh, we will return to kind of a monastic period where we will create alcoves, uh, enclaves rather, of, of spiritual purity, whether it be homes or some institutions, our churches, maybe some learning institutions, and we'll shore those up and secure them so that the forces of secularism can have the marketplace, but they can't have where our heart beats. That's the deal. And yet, you know what we're finding? Those are options that are no longer available to us. You can't give up, and you can't shore up, because society is saying you have to join up. Eric Erickson, a conservative commentator, says famously, you will be made to care. See, so you, you're being formed and encouraged and coerced to fall in line, virtue the virtues, signify them in your behavior, say the words, and say them enthusiastically. Case in point, a couple of weeks ago was the Golden Globe Awards, right? I don't watch these things, but it was an intro, interesting cultural moment. What happened was, uh, it was right on the heels of the Harvey Weinstein uh, scandal, and I'm glad for it, I'm super pleased that Hollywood is finally policing its sexual misconduct. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So all the more for transparency and accountability in that realm, yes. Well, as protest, the women of that community decided that they would wear black to the award ceremony. Well and good, I have no problem with that. What was interesting to me is what happened after the event because there were media outlets, both locally and internationally, that listed the women who did not wear black. Now, there are about 6,000 people at the Golden Globes. You know how many did not wear black? Three. And you can find their pictures online. And they were called to account. Why did they not fall in line? Now, let's ask for a minute. Did these women honestly want to stand with Harvey Weinstein? Were they supportive of sexual exploitation? No, but they failed to virtue signal. They failed to wear the right drab. And because of that, they were called into account. They were shamed into conformity. I doubt any of those three will ever step out of line again. And if it's not shame to create conformity, then there's sanction. <coughs> Something significant happened just this year, this past year, and results of it will come clear in the early summer. Uh, Jack Phillips, a designer, a cake designer, to call him a baker would be too simple. He's a designer, right? He has creative talents. He, he makes cakes, but he designs really elaborate cakes. And he had a, a staff of seven. He was a successful designer, a very gentle, unassuming individual, a Christian man. Well, a couple of years back, this is even before the legalization of gay marriage, a couple approached him and asked him to make a wedding cake. They were a gay couple. He explained, in his opinion, very kindly, that he cannot do so because that would infringe on his views and his sincerely held beliefs. They went from there and they sanctioned him through the government. And all kinds of limitations were imposed on him. Now, let's be clear. He has no problem serving gays. He's done that throughout his career. He's been consistent in refusing to make all manner of cakes that he considered offensive. This is not an issue of him being bigoted against anyone. It's about will he use his God-given artistic talents to communicate a message that he feels to be wrong. And because of that, it's gone all the way to the Supreme Court, and we will only find out in July this year, if it's permissible for Christians in the United States of America to have the free expression of their religion. 
And the tendency when we hear from the court is to shrug, give up, shore up, or join up. More and more we live in a world where we're being coerced to conform. And you say, Eugene, you're over-exaggerating that. And I say, not at all, because so many of us have become so conditioned to walk on eggshells, we don't even realize that our stride is now hobbled. How often do we make decisions about the words that cross our lips, thinking about what will the response be? How will this be received? Will I create offense? Will there be repercussions? Christians are making decisions about the expression of their faith, not out of conviction, but more out of fear. But we live in a period of peace where there is conformity. And that is the situation in which Zacharias speaks. What does he see? What does he say? Well, there is this cry in verse 12, God, when will you, when will you be gracious? Verse 13, and the Lord answered, gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, cry out, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion, and I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry but a little, they furthered the disaster. So here is the context. God says, I am exceedingly zealous for my people. Now, if they don't see it, they're not feeling it. They've just been through 70 years of judgment. It seems like God's favor has withdrawn and yet God is saying, I, don't, I know you don't see it, but my passion for you is great. I am zealous towards you. And I'm angry at those who are at ease, those at peace, because while I use them to bring judgment, they have exceeded their warrant. They've gone way beyond and have brutalized you more than was called for. My father spoke well of his father. I didn't know my grandfather very well. Um, he died when I was very young. He was a German immigrant to South Africa, and everything that Germany is known for, he embodied. He was stoic and resolved, hardworking, not very expressive. My father never remembered his father ever saying, I love you. There was only one occasion that he was ever held by his dad. And that wasn't because my grandfather was a man absent of love. He obviously did love his family. He tended to them. He provided for them. And from his perspective, provided everything he could. But there was this one occasion where my father uh, hurt himself on some farm equipment and looked pretty severe. Fortunately, it wasn't. But in that moment of fear and terror, my grandfather grabbed my dad and held him tight. And in that moment, my father understood the relationship differently. He'd always known that his dad loved him, just by the way he conducted him. But it was in that moment of zealous protectiveness that my dad experienced the love differently. So much so that he resolved that he was going to be very expressive as a father, and he really was. But that's what's happening in this moment. Israel is beaten, Israel is bruised, and, and God is pulling Israel close and saying, I care for you and I tend to you. In this moment, the people of God are moving from a head knowledge where I know that God loves me to a more emotional place where there is a sense of comfort. And that awareness that God is zealous for his people changes everything because not only does he love us, but he has an ambition for us. And that ambition should change the way we live. Let's keep reading about that ambition. 16. Thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, declares the Lord of hosts, and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. Beautiful picture. Zechariah in chapter 2 then tells that same story, but he does it through a vision, and that gives us a vision of what God has in store. So turn your page, uh, chapter 2, verse 1. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. 
and measuring line. This is a building tool. It is a line, a cord that you use to mark out the parameters of what you're going to build. And then I said, what are you go where are you going? And he said to me, to measure Jerusalem, to see what is its width and what is its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, Run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire around her, declares the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. So the picture here is of a man who's in Jerusalem, Jerusalem is beat down, it's broken, they're busy rebuilding, and here's a measuring line. And what he's doing is he's going to the old lines, the old borders where the walls were, and he's measuring. This is where Jerusalem will be rebuilt on the rubble. It will restore its previous glory. This is what's coming. And the angel says, stop. Why? Because your, your lines are too narrow. Your ambitions are too small. Don't, don't be thinking about what once was. I intend to exceed that. Right? He, he goes on in um, verse 9. He talks about how things are going to change. But before we get there, let's have a look at Isaiah. Isaiah 54 is very much the same sentiment. Here's the picture that is given to Isaiah. This is before the exile. But God's purposes for Jerusalem were still the same. God doesn't change. Isaiah 54, the scripture will be up for you. He says, Sing, O barren one who did not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, You who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. So the picture is of a people who are barren. They can't have children. He says, no, there will be many. Your number will be great. Then he talks about a tent. Enlarge the place of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes for you will spread abroad to the right and to the left and your offspring will possess the nation's and will people the desolate cities. God says, I don't want you to have a cramped vision of the future. I know you're living in a situation where there is this forced peace, but I don't want that to somehow give you tunnel vision as to what I'm going to achieve. What I'm going to achieve is greater than the glory days of old. You need to expand your ambitions. Think beyond the current, even beyond the best of the past, what I have in store is mighty and great. Is that not a great encouragement to us today? Because we can sit and fret over what nine men and women in black coats will decide about religious liberties and, and get all bent out of shape about what will come. And the answer is what will come will not be decided in Washington, D.C. It's been decided in the heavenly realms. There is a king there and he has an ambition and it exceeds anything that our limited imagination can grasp. We have a great and mighty God, and He owns the future, and He's zealous about you. Now, I want us to be cautious here because there's a dirty trick that Christians often play when they read the Old Testament. They can take promises that are made specifically to a people in a specific place and make them universal. Where God speaks to a people in time and place and says, oh, well, that's about us too. But in this case, that's not the situation. We know this because the Apostle Paul uses this exact scripture. This is what Paul says in Galatians. Galatians 4.2 But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those who, of the one who has a husband. Now you, brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. He's basically saying this promise is not limited to the people of Israel. He's saying those who believe in Christ Jesus, indeed, you're the ones that are going to be the children of promise. There is a Jerusalem that is bigger 
than this plot of land in, in Palestine. No, there is a Jerusalem that's heavenly. What we need to realize is the Jerusalem that is pictured is merely the point of origin. God's dominion is going to spread from there across the globe. As Abraham Kuyper said, there is no centimeter, there's no portion of earth that God does not look at and say, mine. Right? It's all his. Is he, he's able to look at it and go, that's mine. He rules over it all. In Jerusalem, if you were to go there today, you could go to the Cynical. It's a, it's a building, double-story building, somewhat unassuming. And it's very fascinating what you would experience in this one building. It's two stories. And archaeologically, there's no foundation to this whatsoever. Right? This seems to be a building built during the Crusader period. Nevertheless, during some time in the past, it came to be believed that this building housed two important historical sites. At the bottom is the tomb of David. And so if you were to visit it like I have, you would go in there, and there is a crypt that's covered with rich fabric, and it is surrounded by Orthodox Jews who are praying faithfully, fervently, without ceasing. What are they praying for? For the Messiah to come. Because when David and his descendant returns, Jerusalem will be restored. It will no longer be a divided city. The lines will be laid out and Jerusalem will have its pride of place. That's their ambition. That's why if you go in there, you will find a crypt. Who knows whose bones are inside of it? But that's of no concern. It's the, it's the zeal of the Jews praying within. You go upstairs... And you're in the cynical. It comes from the Latin word to eat. It's the upper room. It's what early Christians believed was where Jesus had the last meal. Now, is that not fascinating? That in one building, you have a group of people anticipating a Messiah, and just inches above it, you have another group of people celebrating someone who did come. And he didn't come simply to lay out the lines of an existing Jerusalem. But it's empty. There's no praying happening in there. Because it's accomplished. He is king. And even though we haven't seen the culmination of his kingdom, he is king. And as Christians, we ought to conduct ourselves differently. So I gave you a couple of cheesy words. I'm going to give you one more. Right? You can give up. Right? You can shore up. There's join up. How about this for a fourth one? How about heads up? Instead of being bowed and cowed, timid and agreeable, let's put some swagger back into our evangelicalism. Let's stand up tall and realize that we're children of the king. You know, one of the things that have been limited in football today is the celebrations. The celebrations are, are too excessive, we're told they take too long and they're kind of vulgar. Fair enough. But still the athletes find ways to celebrate their accomplishments. Here's an odd one. You'll have seen it. Right? A player will score a touchdown and everyone breaks out into euphoria and he makes the shushing sound. Well, why on earth would someone say, shh, when he has accomplished something great? Let's keep reading. We're back in Zechariah. <coughs> Look at verse 9. Behold, I will shake my hand over them. He's talking about those who plundered them. And they shall become plunder for those who served them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, and behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and you shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion, the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent. All flesh before the Lord, 
for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. When an athlete makes a shushing moment, what's he talking to? His detractors and his critics. Stop your boasting. My actions speak louder than your words. God here says, shh, my actions will speak louder than your words. It's a fascinating paragraph. It starts off with peace and ends with silence. There is an oppressive peace where the strong men and oppressors of the age try to force conformity, and God says, in the end, I will bring about a genuine and real peace. Therefore, we need to start changing the way we conduct ourselves. I remember when I was a school teacher, we used to think about how kids come out of the womb because kids are so different in their character. There's some kids that are really timid, right? It's almost as though these kids come out the womb holding a, a, a pacifier or a blankie. Right? They're, they're timid. And then there's other kids that seem to come out the womb in a leather jacket with stogie in the mouth. You know, they go, <laughs> bring it. You know? They're just born differently. And hey, if you're born again, you're born with a royal signet on your finger. You're a son and the daughter of the Most High. You don't have to be cocky with a bring it attitude, but let's, let's walk tall. Let's be ambitious. Let's not be preoccupied with trying to reclaim the glory days, the best that was or all be that we have. No. I want to tell you here at Fellowship, we just had an elders retreat last week, two weeks ago. And, and I want to tell you, your leadership is not content to think about the better days that once were. We are eagerly and zealously expanding the tent. I mean, we're, in a couple of weeks, Randy's going to Panama to see about mission opportunities, and we're going to, hopefully, God willing, extend opportunities even there. I think about our ministry to the young adult population here at Fellowship and in Jackson as a whole, and we've seen how God has blessed that, that demographic. I want you to know, if you're a college student or a young professional, we're going to invest in your future. This is a great initiative for us, and we'll be talking more about that to come. Uh, when you think about our, our youth ministry and how we want to encourage our students to be on the mission field, our investment there many ways our online presence and how we can use the internet to communicate the gospel far afield there is no stopping the ambitions that we have not because we want to build a kingdom but because he's building the kingdom it's his accomplishment and we're just willing tools in the hands of the maker concludes both in isaiah and in zechariah with sing there is a sense of euphoria, victorious joy in worship. We ought to have that too. When we come into a place of worship, it pleased me this morning. You did so good as a church. Not just to hear the band, but when I can hear behind me and I can hear you singing as a people with conviction. Our, our, our banner is our voice and our testimony as we're proclaiming, yes, our King, and yes, our future. We ought to be living a life of confidence. We don't have to be objectionable. We certainly want to be considerate to those who are lost or confused. But do not be timid in your faith. For he will bring about silence rather than an artificial peace. Let's pray together. Lord God, you are good and gracious to us, and in every way we come before you and ask for your mercy. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that in spite of the troubles of this time, the world that seems so uncertain and so f alien in many ways to what many of us remember, we look to you knowing that there is a future that is brighter than the day where your presence will be in our midst. Amen.